My name is Nora Urea, Vice President of IFFD. This year, the IFFD side event during the Commission on Population and Development will be held virtually for the first time. We will address family support services and the impact of the coronavirus disease on food security, nutrition, and well being. Today, IFFD will feature three important updates a new OECD report on family support services, the perspective of the most vulnerable from the work of ATD Fourth World, and a regional perspective on nutrition and well being from CREN in Brazil. They all highlight how the pandemic has shifted earlier thinking on broader questions of sustainable food systems and the importance of incomes, supply chains, and program del delivery for families around the globe. Our first presenter is Mr. Olivier Thévenant, who will talk about the OECD study findings. Mr. Olivier Thévenant is the head of the Children's Wellbeing Unit at the OECD Center for Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and equal opportunity, which among other things is responsible for the child well being data portal. His recent work focuses on child well being measurement and policies, family and child poverty, services for families, and the policy challenges raised by the diversification of family living arrangements. He is co author of the new OECD study on family support. This report shares evidence on good service delivery practices and on efficient service organization that are crucial to ensure that the services provide benefits to families who need them most. It will therefore be useful for policymakers, family professionals, and researchers from OECD countries and beyond. Olivier, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Nora, for this uh, introduction and, and welcome everybody. Uh, let me first share my uh, my screen. I think I hope that everybody now can uh, see my screen. Um, uh, just a few words about the, the study we have uh, uh, carried out, uh, uh, and we, we we started to to work on these issues a little over a year ago. So, uh, and uh, at this point of time, uh, I would never have bet that the topic we are discussing today family support services would have such an important role in the daily lives of families today uh, in france uh, but i'm sure it is also true uh, in the countries you are connected uh, to today uh, there is no thing uh, there is not a single day without the news highlighting the distress of families and children coping with the economic social and psychological consequences of the covid 19 pandemic Yeah, that works. Um, so we, we are all very familiar with reports stressing that policy measures are, such as the lockdowns, school closures, and teleworking from home are generating high incidence, anxiety, uh, sleeping disorders, and other mental uh, health issues among parents and children. In addition, Many families who were in a fragile economic situation before the pandemic have been pushed into poverty or have great difficulties to meet aims. For instance, in our survey, Risk That Matter, run in 25 OECD countries in autumn uh, 2020, we found that 12% that of households with children failed to pay a usual expense, such as rent, mortgage, utility, or credit card bills, while 4% of all households with children asked a charity or non-profit institution for assistance because they, uh, they could not afford to pay for usual uh, expenses. And obviously, some groups of families and children have been hit very hard by the disruption of teaching or by the disruption of many services disadvantaged families we are receiving before the crisis the crisis has only made things going worse for the already vulnerable families and increased the needs of supports of families how can we better help families in, in such circun circumstances and how can we better prepare parents and children to cope with such shocks 
These are the key questions our study wanted to explore. However, the work I am presenting today was undertaken before the pandemic onset. There was already a clear desire from OECD countries to get better knowledge of the wide range of services that exist in many countries to support families in their daily lives beyond the standard support uh, families usually receive for childcare and to balance work and family. In order to explore this area, we had first to delimit the scope and range of services being covered by our study. And we decided to focus on services supports that are provided to help parents improve their child rearing capabilities and to make parenting behavior and family functioning more conducive to good child outcomes. The type of services available in this area vary, of course, from country to others, uh, and also within countries, since many of these services are operated at a local level. Nevertheless, in all countries, there are services in all the major categories of domains listed on this slide. First countries have various measures in place to help families who are finding, finding it difficult to meet the basic material needs of household members, especially with regards to food, clothing, toiletries, housing or transportation. These measures can take the form of school meal programs, food or clothing vouchers, subsidized access to social housing, shelters, transportation. Although um, sometimes cash payments can be tied to families' participation in services in order to encourage uptake of services and programs. There's also a range of services that are provided to support uh, maternal and child physical and mental health. And the provision of these services is operated through various channels, including prenatal and postnatal care services, general health services or school-based services. Family functioning services are also provided to help families cope with stress and improve the functioning of the family. It involves in-home supports, family counseling services, or respite services which are dedicated to support families during times of family crisis. Countries also provide a variety of programs to build parents' knowledge and competencies around child rearing and to improve the parent-child relationship. Finally, a range of specialized services are provided to address the complex needs of vulnerable families, such as when a family member is disabled or uh, is placed in a socially disadvantaged situation. These services, if they are properly integrated into the social support network, can help address important family issues. And their role is also key in preventing that small problems turn into serious issues. So uh, that is the context. And to better support families, we need to figure out what are good practices in that field and what are the options to enhance service quality in this area. To answer these questions, we decided to collect information on government and municipal policies in this area, as well on service provider practices. Therefore, we developed two questionnaires for which we obtained the responses in January and February last year, just before the lockdown was decided in many countries. This slide shows the structure of the questionnaire that was sent to the ministries of social affairs and to capital cities of OECD countries. We collected information on policy priorities and governance structure, on program content, evaluation processes, but we have been much less successful in collecting consistent data on cost and funding because the categorization used in social protection accounts do not allow an accurate identification of public spending on family services at all levels of government administrations. The second questionnaire targeted service providers and was sent to over uh, 600 uh, organizations. Around 170 organizations from 29 countries completed the questionnaire fully. As you can see in that slide, 
we collected information on service delivery practices, on the processes service providers put in place to reach vulnerable families, to coordinate their action with other providers and with social agencies. We also uh, gathered information on evaluation practices and on the use of digital tools by service providers. Uh, we have uh, collected a lot of evidence, lots of examples of programs of qualitative information on delivery practices, uh, but I would like to use the time that remains to focus on the main conclusions and recommendations we draw from this work in order to engage a discussion with you all. The first thing that is essential to provide good support is to make sure that families' needs can be identified and addressed early as soon as needs emerge. This is true for all families, but even more so for expectant parents and parents uh, with very young children who are often learning what parenting is all about. For this reason, a few countries are now paying great attention to the adequacy and the coherence of the supports they provide during the first uh, uh, 1,000 days of children's life. The idea is to ensure that parents can enter into a well-defined, continuous and tailored system of prevention and support covering the family from child conception. The aim is also to complement health checks with a broader assessment of families' wellness, uh, which encompasses their needs regarding social and psych psychological assistance or with regards to family functioning and work and family life reconciliation. However, only a handful of OECD countries have taken steps to promote such way of integrating family support into one coherent system. For families with school aged children, schools gather all children at one place. And for that reason, schools are important resources to operate health checks, such as vision, hearing, or dental screenings. Some basic assistance can also be provided at school. For instance, school meals programs are key to provide children with food security and good quality nutrition for children in need. However, not all OECD capital cities operate such service as our survey revealed that almost one third more, uh, uh, one third uh, did, uh, of capital cities, sorry, did not provide systematic food assistance to families with school age children through either school meals programs, food banks, or by any other channel. Schools can also play an important role in detecting needs for psychological uh, or social assistance, and they make it easier to follow up with children requiring support who otherwise are reliant on the parent to bring them to appointments with support providers. Still, in-home support may remain a solution when there is a risk for children receiving assistance at school to be socially stigmatized. However, across OECD capital cities, only one third uh, of these cities reported that uh, they operate in-home support for families with school aged children. Supplementing the, the provision of services with conditional cash transfers can also be an effective way to encourage take up and extend use of services. This approach is quite common in developing countries, but is far less frequent in high income settings. Yet our survey across OECD capital cities revealed that about half of capital cities support needy families taking up services with conditional cash transfer. As you know, service quality uh, in the area of family services is a big issue. This area is indeed populated with a variety of factors and programs of which the cost and quality may vary substantially. And ensuring the provision of high quality services is key to build trust in this area, to encourage families taking up services, as well as to encourage governments to invest public money on programs with proven positive effects on families' outcomes. Staff qualification and skills is an important issue 
But equally important is that staff in family support services are highly exposed to high risk of burnout and a high turnover due to, to job stress associated with working with highly disadvantaged families. However, the support staff receive from their employers seems rather limited since just over half of service providers indicated in the questionnaire that they provide individual check-ins and assistance to help their staff cope with job stress. Therefore, there seems to be room for incentivizing good professional development practices by, for instance, conditioning renewal or, of, or accreditation to staff participation in professional development programs. One big challenge to get effective impacts on family outcomes also lies in the capacity of the service system to address the often complex and intertwined issues family members face at the same time. A few approaches are developed to deliver coordinated action and meet the needs of all family members. One of them is called the two-generation approach that focuses equally and intentionally on services needed to empower adults and children in the family. It usually involves surrounding the family with coordinated support to help reach families to best cover their diverse needs, to provide tailored support and coordinated support in different areas of life. Therefore, two-generational programming can include health services and training services, job search assistance, early childhood education programs, as well as parenting or family functioning programs. Last, service evaluations are crucial to ensure that practices with highest impact on family outcomes are identified and that knowledge is shared across stakeholders. More than eight in 10 survey respondents reported that they conduct regular evaluation of service delivery processes, but surprisingly, only about half of responding respond, uh, providers reported that they conduct impact evaluation. Last, uh, the development of digi digital tools is creating new opportunities to deliver service effectively and increase services reach. Globally, the use of digital technologies by family support service providers seem to, to remain rather limited. Only one quarter of providers indicated in the questionnaire that they used digital tools within their practice. In most cases, service providers use digital tools for external communication purposes, for instance, using social media to increase their reach and program participation rates. Relevant applications, websites, and platforms can help service users navigate the service system. And from a public policy perspective, it can help delivering a swift response to families' needs. Service providers can also leverage digital tools to help with internal administrative work and internal communication, for example, through online methods and record keeping, or to share case work documentation. However, only 4% of service providers indicated that they use tablets or paperless systems within their work. While creating opportunities to provide timely assistance, the diffusion of digital resources requires strict legal safeguards to ensure that the collection and use of data are compatible with family and individual privacy. I look forward to listening to your comments, but before doing so, let me thank the many partners without which it would not have been possible to carry out this study. Uh, and in particular, I would like to acknowledge the, the very great support that we received from the International Federation for Family Development, together with other uh, key uh, players in, in that field, uh, key networks uh, such as the European uh, the European Social Network, Families Canada, but also the International Step-by-Step -step Association. 
Um, and uh, we also received great support from our uh, delegates uh, um, uh, connecting with the, the ministries of social affairs uh, and connecting with, with uh, capital cities. Uh, I, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and I'm, uh, and I'm uh, uh, very much looking forward for, for the discussion and the comments you may have. Thank you, Olivier. I have to say that IFFD feels proud of having supported your report and we look forward to our continued collaboration in the future. Now I would like to open the floor for questions. We do have our first question lined up um, and I will read that to you, Olivier. How can the first thousand days approach help design integrated services for families? That's your first question, Olivier. Sorry, but not sure I, I did get your question very, uh, quite right. You, you are asking uh, how the, the, the first uh, thousand days are integrated to social, to social service delivery. Is that your question? Yes, I, yes. How can this approach help design integrated services for families? Um, the, the the whole idea behind it, this uh, this approach is that uh, uh, is to try to connect as early as possible to identify the needs of pregnant um, uh, mothers and and their and the child as well as the family as early as possible uh, um, to detect their needs and to be able to help them uh, to to guide them uh, and to help them navigate the, the the range of services that that could be offered uh, uh, so uh, the the basic idea is to is to start with uh, the health checks uh, that are provided in the uh, in in most of uh, OECD countries and to uh, associate with health checks the uh, um, the, the work of uh, social uh, assistance worker, uh, uh, or social workers, uh, to be a, uh, to be able to identify the the, the needs of vulnerable uh, pregnant mothers, uh, to be able to 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 prevent uh, the 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 possible issues they they may face, uh, to organize in home visits. Uh, to uh, pregnant uh, women to, to be able to identify the, the, the issues that either the mother but also the father or, or the child may, may have as early as possible. So there, there is this idea about uh, better integrating uh, what uh, uh, usually, still usually is operated quite in silos in many countries where you have on one side uh, the uh, health programs and health search programs that are provided without any support from uh, uh, the social worker uh, area uh, uh, and the uh, the countries which are uh, uh, more advanced in, in that direction try to to uh, systematically associate uh, different professionals uh, to to organize this uh, uh, the, this support and again to identify the needs that may e emerge very uh, early uh, after child conception. I think you are muted, Nora. Okay, we have a couple more questions, Olivier. All right, from Jose Arrujo. Uh, his question is, after an initiative implementation towards family support, it is essential to organize regular evaluation to determine evidence-based interventions. However, in Brazil, we can perceive a significant lack of parents' digital literacy and low family participation rates in our evaluations. For example, only a few percent of parents fill up their evaluation forms. Therefore, how can institutions raise the family engagement in contributing to the evaluations? In this regard, could social media interaction be a solution? Um, th th there is no, no, no single answer to that. That's what, what, what was very surprising in our reports is to, to observe that uh, uh, there, there, there is 
the, the culture of uh, evaluation uh, is not very much spread uh, um, uh, over uh, over service providers. Uh, as I was, I was cited this number. Uh, not sure that it is representative uh, uh, in all countries, but only four percent uh, of service providers that responded to our survey are conduct conducting regular impact evaluations. Uh, so it, it makes it very difficult to to, to promote uh, the uh, the services that with uh, uh, with proven uh, impact on families' outcomes. Then it's very it's very true that the uh, the, um, the digital uh, um, uh, transition uh, uh, can help to to better reach families, but it, it should be accompanied with programs that also support digital literacy, um, uh, because uh, I, I I was uh, uh, um, I was mentioning the evidence we we have that. Uh, uh, digital tools and the uh, the um, the use of platforms that can connect uh, the people with with needs with the the, the, uh, the supply of services is very well advanced in countries where uh, such as Canada, uh, uh, but uh, it's in an area where. Uh, the, there is the infrastructure that uh, that uh, uh, can uh, help organize such platform, and and, and where also there is a, a quite high level of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, digital literacy uh, among the among the, the population or among the social workers. The uh, the idea is uh, also to equip social workers with digital tools uh, and, and that that uh, help them. To identify where the services are located, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then to help uh, uh, families connect with the services, families who uh, don't necessarily have the dig digital uh, literacy themselves. So all the the, the things here uh, is to 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 also you can't promote that that kind of. Uh, of tools without uh, having the assistance of qualified social workers mm -hmm. uh, that should have this uh, qualification, uh, but mm -hmm. that should be able also to assist uh, families uh, who don't have the, uh, the either the access to the digital tools because they don't have the material resources or they don't have the digital literacy. But okay. again, one country like Canada can give good example of good example of good practices in that direction. Very good. Uh, you answered the second question that was uh, in line, and that was how can we uh, how could the digital delivery of services to families be promoted? So I think you covered that well. Let's move on to the last question that we have for you, Olivier, um, and this comes from Genevieve to uh, Tardieu. Um, and she says, in what way the families themselves are taking part in expressing their needs? In what way are they encouraged to do so? The, this, the, 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 they are, uh, yeah, the, the different, uh, um, different ways to, to do that. We, we, we have explored with our uh, surveys uh, a little bit what, what countries uh, are doing at country level. Uh, and also what service providers are doing for that. So there is uh, um, there is a lot of uh, tools that are implemented by service providers to uh, to get feedbacks from from families to adjust their practices uh, and to also uh, co construct the service delivery with with, with families. Um, uh, and in the report, you, you will find uh, uh, examples of, uh, of uh, measures taken by service providers to, to do that. Um, then at country level, governments very frequently uh, try to uh, uh, organize regular uh, uh, consultation of families, either through, through the, uh, uh, the representatives of family associations, or you have sometimes uh, uh, ministries uh, at, uh, in, uh, in central governments or at local level uh, that uh, also are conducting regular surveys to, to uh, better identify needs uh, of families. So 
Um, I think the, the impression we had compared to a few years uh, to a few years ago is that the uh, this idea about uh, having families participating in designing uh, the services they need is is uh, one uh, idea that is progressing in, in many countries. Uh, again, both at uh, at uh, uh, the public authority level, local or, uh, or central government level, but also uh, the uh, at uh, service providers uh, level. Again, uh, you you will find uh, more uh, more details in, in the report where we have uh, a more complete section on how what uh, service providers are doing to to collect and use feedbacks from uh, from families. Very good. Thank you so much, Olivier. Thanks to you. Now to continue, I welcome our next speaker who will talk about the work of ATD Fourth World. Isabel Pipar Peru is the Director General of the International Movement ATD Fourth World. She first joined the Long-Term World Volunteer Corps in 1981 and worked in low-income communities in her native Belgium, as well as in Guatemala, Haiti, France, Switzerland, and Southeast Asia. She holds a degree in social work. ATD Fourth World works to overcome poverty by seeking out people living in the worst economic conditions and exclusion. They hold a vision of a world without poverty and a society where each person is respected. Through grassroots projects, ATD also works to keep families from being separated because of circumstances related to their extreme poverty. So, Isabel, the floor is yes. yours. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. And thank you for giving me the chance to share with you a little of, the, of what comes from the lives of the 150 ATD Fourth World community groups in almost 40 countries in global South and North. Two days ago, here in France, Lisa and Kevin, a young couple had custody of their three months old twins taken from them. At the same time, they were evicted from the family shelter where they were taken in when their babies were born because they were homeless. Lisa and Kevin have a long history of hardship, but also a long history of strength and resistance. And when they came to the shelter, they believed that they could be a family. But in the shelter, from the start, the professionals look at them in their poverty and doubted their ability to raise young children. Nobody came forward to support the young father so that he could take part in a training or work project. So Lisa and Kevin, together 24 hours a day in their room at the shelter, began to argue. They also left the shelter as often as possible which is forbidden right now by health measures in France. The social workers started to fold them for this situation. Things got heated. Last Thursday, it was decided that their children would be taken away from them and placed in care, and that Lisa and Kevin would have to leave the shelter. They were thrown out on the street while the country is under, under lockdown. Why is it that what is initially thought to be support for parents often turns into control of the families with the hardest lives? Because of this, many of the families we know are reluctant to ask for help from family support services for fear that the system will interfere in their lives, put their family under the microscope and shatter it. Basically, they are blamed for their situation. They are seen as responsible for what is going on. So they are not trusted. We don't see or share their hopes and seem to be unaware of their efforts. So solution design for them but not with them, are imposed on them. 
This is why too often policies and programs backfire on the families living in poverty. Lisa and Kevin's situation shows how much families in situation of poverty face an accumulation of deprivations. And they are also dealing with social and institutional mistreatment. This reality also emerged from the participatory research we conducted from 2016 to 2019 in partnership with Oxford University. This research brought together people experiencing poverty, academics, and practitioners from six countries for, from the global south and from the global north. In this research, participants highlighted together the dimension of poverty. Indeed, the ambition of the Sustainable Development Goal is to end poverty in all its forms and dimensions. But to do that, we still need to know these forms and dimensions. The reality of poverty is complex and cannot be confined to a few indicators. And people and families experiencing poverty encourage us to go further with them to understand it. The merging of knowledge methodology used in this research place the knowledge of people experiencing poverty on a par with that of academics and practitioners. Their participation allowed nine key dimensions of poverty to emerge and be named. And I don't know if Inacio or Alex could show the slide I sent to you. Three of them, yes, three of these dimensions we are familiar with. They are about lack of access to decent work or income, to housing, health, and education. Three dimensions are more hidden. They are about relationships. They include social and institutional mistreatment, and the fact that the strengths and experience of people experiencing poverty, as well as their contribution to supporting those poorer than themselves, are ignored and sometimes even denied. For example, because you are poor, because you know what it means to be rejected from everywhere, you open your door to others and you are told that's irresponsible to bring homeless people into your home when it's already overcrowded. And at the heart of the experience of poverty, participants name suffering. The suffering in mind body and heart results from disempowerment caused by deprivation and maltreatment central also to the experience of poverty is the way people respond to it through struggle and resistance with this dimension of poverty in mind we can see how the pandemic and the measures taken to deal with it have made the situation even worse Alicia is an ATD force well activist and young mother. In Latin America, she has been through difficult times. She told us about the decisive moment during the pandemic. Alicia lives in a shanty town with her mother and other family members. That night, Alicia and her mother could not sleep. Both women were worried. They were thinking about Veronica, who cannot sell her donuts anymore after school because of the lockdown. And about Felipe, who is not allowed to go out to collect the plastic bottles that he resells for a living. In normal times, people in extreme poverty do not have access to decent jobs. The work they find is the most precarious, dangerous, and poorly paid. During lockdown, they can't even hope for this kind of work, which is their only source of income. The situation would be different if social protection floors had been put in place in each country as the 2030 Agenda asks us to do. In order to end poverty in all its form everywhere, 
we urgently need to implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all. At that night, for Alicia and her mother, it was, it was clear that if nothing were done, in two weeks' time, there would be death in the neighborhood. Not death from the coronavirus, but death from hunger. So Alicia, who now has a stable job, gets together with her neighbors and then reaches out to some other people who have more security. Together, they get a solidarity project of the ground that involves sharing what they have. Alicia tells us, we will stand together and when the crisis is over, we will be able to say that we have not abandoned anyone. Alicia knows that state aid will arrive at some point, but that it, but that it will not reach some of her neighbors who don't have identity papers, which means they won't be able to register on the list for state aid. For sure, it's a challenge for the authorities or civil society organizations to reach the families who have the most difficult lives, the ones with the fewest connections or networks. The families in deepest poverty very often remain invisible. A big obstacle is the lack of identity papers. That means not getting into school, receiving social assistance, or becoming citizens. So, as Alicia notes from experience, sharing is a big piece, and that has to continue. Because in times of crisis, whether it is a pandemic, floods, or the repeated crisis of daily hardship, families in greatest poverty count first and foremost on the solidarity of those around them. This solidarity, which is fragile and constantly threatened, is not enough to end extreme poverty, but it is vital. And anti-poverty programs and policies should recognize and strengthen these family and community solidarities instead of ignoring or sometimes even undermining them. The pandemic and the lockdowns have also worsened the educational situation for children and young people. Schools were closed and many did not reopen a year later, depriving a whole young generation of an essential means of access to knowledge and culture. Distance learning has put families living in poverty in an impossible situation. How do you choose between feeding the children or paying for an internet connection to follow the lessons? How do you get the materials? Or do you make space for the children to concentrate in cramped and overcrowded housing? How do you support them when you haven't learned to read and write yourself? Among children who have not been able to return to school, many already before the pandemic were experiencing difficulties at school, feeling that school was not their world. A school based on competition rather than cooperation does not allow the children in deepest poverty to find their place and learn. This is a definite priority to reach these children and work not only for a school where the greatest number of children can learn, but where all children can learn. In many countries, and for months on end, the complete shutdown of public services people in poverty depend on has been perceived as an institutional abuse. In some countries, the benefit system has been moving online. People struggling with access and technology can receive sanctions for a perceived failure to comply and be left with nothing to feed their families. What is less known is the effect that the closure of services has had on the relationship between parents and children in foster care. No more visits and meetings possible. 
We had to fight for children and parents to be able to talk to each other just once every two, three, four weeks, even if only by telephone. But how do you maintain a relationship with a very young child by telephone? As well, as the courts moved online, families facing threats of placement in foster care or in adoption for their children had to deal with family courts hearing online. Without a good Wi-Fi connection or laptop, most of, most of them had only a mobile phone to try to participate in the hearing concerning them. We saw so much it. Yes, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to give you a one minute warning. We have one more minute for your presentation before we give you a couple of questions. Ah, sorry. Thank you. So in research, like in life, what, what families facing poverty ask is that we recognize them as actors in their own lives and as partners. Actor with their suffering, their resistance, their power to act, is too often stifled by deprivation and social exclusion, but never reduced to nothing. Alicia and her family live in insecurity, but still they put their energy and inventiveness into launching an action to share what they little have with neighbors. Actors with their intelligence who only ask to be considered as equal partners in searching for solution and their implementation. But for this to happen, we need more places where people experiencing poverty and other actors, policymakers, social workers, teachers, nurses, academics, simple citizens can share their experience, merge their knowledge and build new knowledge and strategies together to design and implement programs and policies that really tackle the most extreme situation of poverty. We need to think together. Getting the feedback of the users is not enough. The people want to be from the beginning to the end in the design, the implementation and evaluation of programs and policies. And the pandemic is exposing and increasing the inequalities and precariousness that existed before the virus spread. But it can also push us to question ourselves as human beings together and to decide, like Alicia and her family, that we will stand together and no one will be abandoned. But to achieve this, could we conceive policies which tackle poverty and support families in poverty by taking in consideration all the dimensions of poverty, including the hidden ones? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Isabel. I think you answered the question that I was going to be posed to you. And that was, uh, what would be your recommendation to governments to do first as we exit the pandemic? And I think you covered that very well towards the end of your presentation. So thank you very much. We're going to uh, continue uh, and welcome our next speaker who will share the regional perspective on nutrition and well-being in Brazil. Maria Paula de Albuquerque is the clinical general manager at CREN she is a medical doctor and pediatrician, member of the Brazilian Society of Pediatricians and of the Brazilian Research Group Nutrition and Poverty at the Sao Paulo University. CREN is an international reference in the area of nutritional education and treatment of primary nutritional disorders working in Brazil. They have demonstrated that positive impact that an organization, an organization can have when the real needs of the person are, may, are its main goal. So Maria Paula, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks and foremost, um, thanks for the committee, organization committee uh, for having me, for inviting me. Um, let me share my screen with you. Just a minute, okay. So uh, it's great pleasure and uh, being with uh, you today. I would like to share some of our experience, especially last year with undernourished children in Sao Paulo city, uh, the largest city uh, in Brazil. 
CREM, uh, that means a Center of Recovery and Nutritional Education, is a non-profit uh, organization and that works, and prevent, that works to prevent and treat malnutrition in the childhood. Since 1993, CREN uh, has helped more than 4 million people. And um, in this time, the CREN is composed of both a district and an interdisciplinary team that includes social works, physical educators, nurses, doctors, nutritionists, psychologists, and teachers. Together, we actively involve families during treatment, contributing to the recovery of health, straightening relationships, and assisting in the achievement of permanent results. Our mission is to mitigate malnutrition in childhood for the integral development of the person and the family. For 30 years, CREN has been fighting malnutrition in the most underserved neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. Taking care of children, adolescents and their families in three areas. Research, multiplication in training and assistance. CREN methodology uh, was de developed by the Federal University of Sao Paulo doctors professors. This methodology was applied and validated in its assistance to scale for other spaces such as different cities, states, or countries. This methodology, based on this intervention model, promotes continuous feedback and a virtual cycle between those areas. In these 30 years, universities in Brazil and around the world find that CREN a space for internships, work experience placements, and research development. We have published more than 100 scientific articles and nine books. We are a practical field for undergrade and postgraduate courses. In 2020, we focus on COVID-19 and food security. Last year, we participated in eight seminars, nine lectures to nutrition graduate students, and 11 interviews in the media, such as TV, radio, and paper press. We offer for governments, companies, institutions, and communities customized and nutritional interventions. I'm aim for health promotion through nutritional, nutritional and health eating habits. Training and, super, uh, and superv supervision, health community agents are particularly important as they generally have a stronger relationship with the people and territories they serve. It's an amazing knowledge exchange and valorization of local resources. And in 2020, in partnership with UNICEF and AVSI, we trained and supervised dietitians and health community agents focused on the higher prevalence of malnutrition in refugee Venezuelan children in our country. Treatment is offered in three ways, directly in community, through consultations on the outpatient clinic, or in cases of moderate or severe undernutrition in children under the age uh, of five, treatment is offered within the day hospital in a model similar to uh, daycare. In order to talk about our assistant model, um, it's necessary to understand the place where we work. Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. The distance between the richest and the poorest is huge. In 2020, and I'm sorry, in 2010, 2.1 million people were living in Sao Paulo slums. At that time, the city presented a 1.8% of growth population rate. Wow, slums increased by 
3.7%. When we are, are uh, assessing the slum population using home visit surveys, we found a higher prevalence of undernutrition compared to the national data. So then we talk about the invisible children. Active search through home visits is, in, is an important aspect of our methodology. We actively search for children and adolescents in underserved communities through the use of anthropometric censuses, while involving the community and their leaders. Nutritional recover occurs due to the infection control and the improvement of eating habits, which are worked on in nutritional education workshops for children according to their age group. We also identify the needs of each family through the bond and trust that our team develops with them. Families receive psychosocial support where dynamics are monitored and rights is guaranteed. They also participate in educational workshops concerning food security, nutrition, income generation, health, hygiene, and guidance on social rights. We provide workshops such as Art in the Kitchen, where nutritionists prepare low-cost recipes, is to prepare and with high nutritional value. During the workshop, families are encouraged to discuss which foods should be consumed to aid the nutritional recovery of their children, as well as to develop healthier life habits for the entire family. Brazilian, like everybody, have been suffering from COVID-19. We have more than 360,000 deaths and severe social, economic, and health consequences. One out of five families with an income up of up to one minimum wage have, within, have children struggle against hunger. Public food security policies, as the national school feeding program, haven't reached the most vulnerable children because the schools were closed. In this period, our children consume much more unhealthy food, such as soda or, uh, and other ultra-processed food. Our first step was to look for the most vulnerable families already assisted by CREM. We called them, these families to understand how they were dealing with the pandemic situation and bring up their status of food security. We've been using IBIA, Brazilian scale of food security, and we have found in some neighborhoods that more than 70 percent of these families had food insecurity. At this moment, we recognized a great family's misinformation about their rights and benefits, education and health system matters. One out of three fa fa eligible families has, was not assessing their benefits for, extent, uh, for instance, a government stimulus, because they didn't know how to get them. Media was produced during the pandemic by creating short videos on WhatsApp. These videos talking about social rights, nutritional, homeschooling, routine, screen time, and physical activities. As part of the support, we deliver a food basket. Uh, I'm sorry. After we identify the most vulnerable families with children under six in food insecurity, we visit them regarding the sanitary conditions and different 
uh, from Brazilian's president, we followed the correct security protocol. As part of this support, we deliver a food basket. The cream basket differs from the national standard, which contains, in addition to the traditional, the traditional rice and beans, either protein of a better biological value, such as egg, canned fish, milk, organic fruits, and vegetables from urban family farming. In addition, we provide hygiene, cleaning products, books, and games for children to play with their families and reducing their screen time. About urban family farming, we support local, equal, social relationships, leveraging the economy around the territories where we operate, purchasing their products to assist the family in order to reduce insecurity food and promote nutritional recovery, as well as support short food supply chains and the local economy. The funds for this specific intervention came from a solidarity network composed of other social organizations and individuals. In a sub sample in 2020, children with more than two anthropometric measures, we observed that 78% of stunted children showed improvement in Z-score height age index against the 20 who got worse in the index. Remember, stunting re reveals chronic, chronic hunger, while wasting reveals acute hunger. 67% of wasted children showed recovery in their body mass index for age in, in Z-score, but one out of three children did not reach a target despite having assistance. In conclusion, there are three main messages I'd like to highlight about our experience. First, undernutrition and obesity are systemic problems and therefore call for systemic and network responses. Even if, even if your institution is located in a small town or neighborhood and it looks like nothing compared to our planet, it could be a powerful acupuncture point to release the energy system and catalyze good things. Essentially, what I mean is think global, act local. Second, it's possible to offer emergency assistance along with the promotion of human development. Every family and territory has resources no matter how tough the, situa the situation is. So it is always possible to do with assisted family and not only for the assisted family. At least, but not last, the importance of society to face the health crisis in Brazil. Last year in Brazil, society was the first to respond to the health crisis by creating networks of solidarity. Without community leaders and social organizations, the pandemic scenario could, be, ha could have been much worse. Our work has been possible through partnerships with individuals, companies, and institutions, those who are aware that we must work together for the development of a just, healthy and sustainable society. Unfortunately, some politicians in my country fail to recognize that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Maria Paula. We are happy to bring such an interesting regional perspective on the theme of this year's Commission for Better Nutrition and Food Security. We have time for one question, uh, and it is going to be posed to you um, from Jose Arrujo uh, once again. 
Uh, a recent study from Society for Neuroscience shows a relationship between good alimentation and successful learning. In this regard, do you think combating malnutrition and unhealthy alimentation could also be ways to leverage child learning? Yes, absolutely. Um, the, I think that the, the nutrition, like good and adequate nutrition is uh, vital for uh, uh, a global development of the children. So especially in the first thousand uh, days that uh, my colleague talked in the first uh, lecture, uh, it's so important uh, the, the the paper, the rule of the nutrients uh, uh, plays in this um, scenario. So uh, breastfeeding, especially the breastfeeding, there is a lot of evidences in our uh, Stanley territory about the, how powerful breastfeeding is and the uh, intelligence co co coefficient and uh, other aspects of the, the um, uh, neural um, development. So I'm uh, pretty sure. Very good. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the audience engagement, even though the circumstances are not ideal. Um, Okay, so moving on, I now give the floor to the president of IFFD, Mr. Olivier Yao, who will deliver the closing remarks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very happy to give this closing remark sitting in the countryside. So don't be surprised if you hear some melodious bird songs or joyful dog barking. The COVID-19 pandemic and the associated disruption of many education, health, social, and family services have emphasized the importance of family support services, including health care and mental health services, child protection, supports towards basic material needs such as food and housing, and specialized services for vulnerable families. For many families, a whole range of needs has to be addressed simultaneously. The challenge for policymakers is then to develop a package that addresses the needs of family, different families, and that is delivered in an integrated manner across different public agencies or and a range of service providers. The supply and the quality of family support services vary across and often within countries, but sharing evidence of good service delivery practices and efficient service organization is crucial to ensure that the services provide benefit the family who need them the most. That is why we are very happy, very happy to have including the presentation of the new OECD study on family support in today's program because it analyzes these aspects and will be useful for policymakers, family professionals, and researchers from OECD countries and beyond. We are also proud of having contributed to the study previous to it. One good example of how civil society participates together with public instances in those services is ATD forward, or together in dignity forward, present today in our program. I thank them very much for being here in these events, and as well for their ongoing efforts to combat the violence of extreme poverty, ignorance, deprivation, and content that isolates people and locks them in silence. You know that the United Nations Commission on Population and Development was to address the special theme, which is population, food security, nutrition, and sustainable development in 2020. But the pandemic made the commission postpone the full consideration of the topic to this year. What we have lived during the past year has underlined the importance of this topic, and as we can see, 
some evidence from the impact of COVID-19, especially in the areas of incomes, supply chains, and program delivery. COVID-19 has truly shifted earlier thinking on broader questions of sustainability food systems. As the report of the United Nations Secretary General for the Commission highlighted even before the pandemic, the current global food system is environmentally unsustainable. A more sustainable future is attainable, but will require transformations in food supply and demand, as well as institutional reforms and strengthen efforts to preserve the natural resource base and mitigate climate change. The world's population must also be well nourished and healthy to achieve the goals and objectives of the programs of action for of the International Conference on Population and Development and all the 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. We brought here an example of how civil society can be part of this endeavor with the participation of the Brazilian organization CREN. -E I thank them very much for their efforts and for their valuable contribution to these events. But the Commission also decided last year to include an agenda item on the future role and organization of the Commission in the provisional agenda of the 54th session of the Commission. In preparation of the consideration of this agenda item, the Bureau of the 54th session held a virtual informal brainstorming meeting on the future role and organization of the Commission on Population and Development. Non-governmental organization in consultative status with the Economic and Social Council participated in the meeting as observers, and we could also contribute with the suggestion that NGOs should be allowed to organize side events without being sponsored by a member state, and that the Secretariat could also include such side events in its event of calendar. This event, this very event in which we are participating is a direct consequence of the approval of both proposals. I thank all of you very much for your presence here in this event. And I hope that you consider it as interesting as I do. Stay well, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you very much. We have reached the end of our event. Before closing, let me remind you that for the first time, the entire IFFD family of 70 countries will be presenting and featuring its work. We will be observing the upcoming International Day of Families on Thursday, May 13th, 2021, to recognize the programs and the positive impact IFFD has made on parenting around the world to bring about healthy families and better children. You are all welcome to join us. So thank you very much for your presence here today. Stay safe, and I hope to see you all in New York next year.